heading to the bell. It looks like a bounce is too much to ask for. The Nasdaq still one and a half percent away from even. Small caps are up. Let's talk about the big picture because tomorrow we have inflation. We had a ton of data this week. We got two great smart guys here with us. We got to take advantage of it. Jeff Kleintop joins us, senior or chief global investment strategist, and Kevin Gordon, senior investment strategist at Charles Schwab. What's up, guys? Welcome to Philly. Welcome yeah, to Impact. Absolutely. Love Impact. Well, it's been pretty busy couple days and we're kind of rounding it out with a bit of a sell-off, adding on to some weakness. I like the way you really put it, Kevin, which was that the ghost of 2021 still haunts the market. Today, bonds are doing okay, but generally we know they haven't been. Yeah, well, it's more about actually from the equity market perspective, at least in the case of the U.S., what we saw in 2021 that was more of a worrisome trend was even as the cap-weighted indexes were moving higher, you had seen pretty significant deterioration under the surface and in breadth metrics. And that's really now what's happening is you've got these opposing forces where sentiment has washed out considerably. So that, you know, in and of itself provides a little bit more of a you know, breeding ground for a rally, but you need a catalyst. Yeah. And we're lacking the catalyst on the breadth side of things where you're seeing across the spectrum, not just in small caps, but, but up the cap spectrum too, even with the Super 7 losing some momentum collectively as a unit, that's working against you. So you're kind of at this push-pull where you can't really get you know, a good catalyst or a bad catalyst in either direction. So I think it keeps us in a little bit of this malaise for a while. Was that kind of the jugular this week to see Alphabet get hit? I mean, I know you don't do specific stocks, but like the fact that that cohort, we can expand out to seven, so it's not a specific yeah. one. That cohort just suddenly like dispersed in half, basically. Well, I think it's more so that you don't look at anything really as a monolith anymore. So even within the Super 7, that's three sectors. It's tech, communication services, consumer discretionary, and each of the biggest names in those sectors account for half or more than half of the sector itself. And the fact that you had such a huge divergence yesterday between communication services and tech, I think tells you that you don't want to just be looking at it as a monolith. You have to look at what the qualities are and the underlying factors are for each company in each sector itself. The stock market is still dicey, I mean, at best, basically, Jeff. But at the same time, our economic data is like shockingly good still, at least relative to where everybody thought we would be here. Is that what we want, Oliver? Do we want strong economic <laughs> The stock market doesn't best. seem like it. No, certainly not, right? So take a look at what's going on overseas probably had a pretty weak third quarter in Germany, right? Very strong third quarter in the U.S. Central Bank, we heard from the ECB today, they are not going to hike. They are probably going to be cutting next year. I'm not sure the Fed is going to be as quick to be able to declare victory on inflation because of the strength, relative strength in the U.S. economy. And now with the Magnificent Seven turning into the, I don't know, Keystone Cops here, uh, we really lost some of that leadership in the U.S. markets. And that's why even today, yes, markets around the world were down, but international markets fared better. What did that print do 4.9 on GDP? to the overall kind of relative perspective on U.S. versus the rest of the world. I mean, did our leadership take another leap forward when we had already kind of been in front? From an economic perspective, without a doubt. If you take a look at the recovery from, from the uh, pandemic, certainly the U.S. leads the way. Uh, China's fumbling to try, try and catch back up. But this is four quarters in a row for Germany without any economic growth. That is a recession, right? But at the same time, those stocks are trading at a discount to their price earnings, uh, their 10-year price earnings multiple average and braced for a more difficult environment. The Europe situation, does that look like then, it seems like if there's anywhere we should start trying to price in cuts, maybe that's where it legitimately is something to think about? I think that's where it begins. Maybe the Bank of Canada, and, which we heard from on uh, yesterday, and, and the ECB. So I think that's where we're going to start to see that turnaround, and that could really help to lift those multiples. What does that mean potentially for the U.S. picture, Kevin? I mean, if, if Europe, I mean, look, everybody wants to chase cuts and liquidity, it seems like still. But if it's coming from a bad place, China still is fumbling, is there hope then that kind of just the money finds its way into U.S. stocks? I'm not sure if it's as easy as that. And, and you have to keep in mind, too, when we think about rate cuts in the U.S., um, you know, pivoting to aggressive rate cuts from hikes or from the pause is very different than a very calibrated, more surgical, you know, one or two cuts here. Um, and, and I think the, from the Fed's perspective, certainly, they want to keep upward pressure on real rates and make sure that they're not overly restricted, but they don't want real rates to be moving back down to where you get to some sort of accommodation phase. So I think that's the dynamic you need to keep in mind. But, you know, from a, from a U.S. perspective, 
flows have actually been relatively broad-based and evenly distributed across the equity universe, but they've actually been much stronger in the bond universe than they have in the stock universe. Yeah, so, people just keep plugging into TLT. Well, yeah, I mean, for yeah, for all of the you know sort of discomfort with the move in yields that we've seen, there have been a fair amount of investors, particularly households, that have jumped into that and actually started to play what we've been saying as defense with the bond market in the face of an equity market that has looked poor under the surface for the entire year, but definitely much worse since the peak in July. I was talking with somebody today that described the TLT flows that keep showing up positive is basically like the kind of institutional fight the Fed trade. Like people really think that if they just keep trying, it's going to stop. But <laughs> as we've seen, you know, like example, earlier this month, we got the NFP report and everybody was excited that the wages were cool. Bonds rallied that day, kind of like we did on GDP. Fast forward three weeks, we're at 5%. What do we look for when we think about inflation tomorrow, Jeff, and the implications that that number might have? Wrap it up for us on that. Well, I mean, inflation is obviously where it all comes down to. And so if you've got very strong inflation backing up this, uh, this idea that growth is just bucking the trend of the rest of the world in the U.S., then we've got some increasing concerns. That probably means a stronger dollar. And yeah, we'll, we'll probably see a push up in yields. It's interesting. I, I'm not sure if all of those flows are speculating on that move or they're hedging the risk of that move. Mm -hmm. be interesting to find out. Yeah. All right. Love it. Great stuff. And you knew I wanted a dollar thought there. You gave it to me, Jeff Clontop. <laughs> Appreciate that. Kevin Gorn as well. Great combo, guys. Good to see you. Good to see, uh, you. see you in half an hour.